In the name I am that I am, son of tomorrow, I call forth the light of the living word, beloved Elohim, beloved archangel, beloved mighty Choans of the rays and the lords of karma. I call for the action of the beloved Pallas Athena, beloved goddess of liberty, beloved Nada, beloved Kuan Yin, beloved Portia, beloved great divine director, beloved all seeing eye of God, Cyclopea. Let God's will be done, let God's will be done, let God's will be done. I demand the action of the sacred fire in this hour, descend now, descend on mighty cosmos, secret rays. I am the holding of the balance of Lord Gautama Buddha, beloved Sanat Kumara and the seven holy Kumara. I call upon the sacred fire, I call upon the light of God that never fails. Beloved mighty iron presence, come forth in this hour of the victory. Come forth in this hour of the victory of the God's flame. I demand the full power, beloved mighty Athena, with us this night. Beloved Jesus, send it to me, Lord, my dear, Gautama and Son of Tomorrow. Come forth now in the victory of the God's flame. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Navigating the Astrological Matrix. I'm your host, Robert Phoenix. And I will be with you for the next 120 minutes. And we're going to do our best to make sense out of what's happening up there, in there, out there, and in all realms that are congruent with our experience here on this third dimensional axis right now in this time and space. Wish us luck. There's a lot happening. There's a hell of a lot happening out there. Today is uh, the first, so, okay, let's set the stage. This show is going to be about Scorpio. We are on the uh, sort of the back end of the Scorpio moon, which kicked in yesterday. And uh, Mercury is in Libra, so we can talk about the Scorpio moon in a very balanced sort of way, which is good. Uh, So we're going to get into Scorpio and the manifestations and dynamics around Scorpio and how they pertain to what's, going on right now and what's going to be taking place over the course of the next two to three months, six months, two and a half years. Uh, We're staring down some very big changes here, boys and girls, and uh, we're going to be looking at some of those changes here forth. Um, So let's take a look at the uh, the stars today. Let's just get into that for a little bit here. I'm going to uh, open up a new window and we'll get into the uh, ephemera. The sun is still in Virgo. And uh, the the great thing about the sign of Virgo as it pertains to all signs is that it allows every sign to have a diagnostic because that's what Virgo does, right? I mean, Virgo is all about analysis. It's all about breaking things down and trying to understand, you know, where things work, where things don't work. So every every sign gets the uh, opportunity to experience Virgo in their own lives. And to take the Virgo and energy and say, you know, what's happening right now? What do I need to change? And how can I change it? And hopefully you can go about it in, a, in an objective fashion. Because uh, sometimes Virgo is uh, a little, maybe a little too subjective at times, especially the Virgo moon. But that's the beauty of Virgo. So we're in it right now still. We've got a few days left. We're uh, headed towards the autumnal equinox which is a very big time, uh, and um, I'll probably get into that a little bit more towards the end of the show. Today's birthdays, uh, an interesting bunch, to say the least. Uh, why don't we start with the birthday of one Brian Epstein, manager of the Beatles, a controversial figure, one shrouded in secrecy, especially around his death and the formation of the Beatles. At the end of the show, I'll, I'll tell my Beatles story again, which I... I've told before, it's kind of an interesting story, but I'll tell it towards the end of the show. Uh, So today is Brian Epstein, or Epstein, however you want to pronounce it. It's his birthday. Uh, It's also the birthday of one Eric Rudolph, and Eric Rudolph is the 
It says here that he is American homicide perpetrator, a serial bomber, who pleaded guilty to bombings at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, which killed one woman and wounded 111 others. It's an interesting number. I was there, by the way. Um, I was at the Olympics, and I was near the uh, – not that I had anything to do with it, trust me. I was doing tarot – I was reading tarot cards, and I was reading tarot cards – about two and a half blocks away, it was by the House of Blues, and that was in the uh, Olympic Village. And I was there, and I had, it was on a Friday night. I'll never forget it. I was just a rocking night. I had a great day. The Olympics were reaching this fever pitch, and um, I think I made about two hundred dollars that day. And I got to tell you, back in nineteen ninety six, two hundred dollars when you're on the road, that's a nice little chunk of change. I mean, I could live easily off of that two hundred dollars for an entire week. Little did I know about what was going to happen as soon as I left the area. You know, it's one of those things where it's all about rhythm. And when you're on the road, you know, you don't want to stay too long in one place. You want to figure out kind of, you know, where you are energy-wise. And I felt like the energy of the day dissipated. It was time for me to leave, so I left. I took off, and I, I went back to my little uh, sort of boot camp site in my van not far from the Olympic uh, Village, probably about uh, six blocks. And then I went to a bar, and I had a beer, and I looked up on the TV set, and all hell had broken loose. And at that point, I knew I would be able to stay around Atlanta because at that time, they already had legions of troops, UN troops, state troops, army, you name it. They were crawling all over the streets of Atlanta during the Olympics. And I just knew that in the days after that, it would not be okay for me to be walking around with a with a cart and a dog reading tarot cards. So I split, and the two hundred dollars that I could have lived on for the week, I uh, actually wound up uh, using on the road. I decided to go to Savannah to do some tarot card reading, and it didn't work out too well, to be honest with you. It was kind of a wasted journey, actually. In fact, I almost got thrown in jail there. It was kind of hairy. Uh, today is also the birthday of Michael Skakel. And Michael Skakel is connected to the Kennedy family, right? I believe. Uh, let's see here. No, blah, 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 blah. He's the Martha Moxley murder. No, not connected to the Kennedy family. But a sketchy. Uh, character nonetheless. So Michael Skakel, I need to. I thought he was connected to Kennedy for some reason. Just not. Anyway, another dubious character, Eric Rudolph. By the way, I you know, he he copped to that years after the fact. I've got my own feelings about it, about what happened down there, but uh, doesn't really matter much now, does it? He's in. He's in a supermax prison and not getting out anytime soon. Speaking of prisons, here's where we get into the the uh, inner sanctum of Scorpio, and we drop down a couple levels, and we begin to look at the square, which is happening right now between Pluto and Uranus. It went, they went direct. Pluto went direct two, two days ago, I believe. And now it's moved into an exact square with Uranus, and this is this is significant. Uh, these our the squares between Pluto and Uranus are not pretty. They're just now we've dealt with the uh, the T squares and the crosses earlier this year when uh, the Sun and the Moon were in Cancer, and even earlier when Saturn was in Libra. So you know we, we've been dealing with this intense. You know, deeply transformational energy. It, so let's just get into the dynamic of the square. What happens with squares is that squares take place at 90 degree angles. Okay. So my metaphor for a square is if you if you pick up a weight, let's say you pick up a, a dumbbell, right? And you pick it up and you and you curl. You do a curl, and that you don't bring the curl all the way up, but you bring the curl halfway up. So your arm is like an L. That is a square, and that is the power of the square. That is theoretically where you're going to get the most strain on your muscle. 
So squares are about growth. Squares build muscle. They also cause strain. The energy, you know, the, the, my uh, one of my friends, Beth Custer, did a track called There Are No Right Angles in Nature. However, there are right angles in architecture and geometry, and that is where we get the square. And the energy is at a hard angle. Unlike the trine or unlike the sextile, when the energy is flow, the square does not flow easily. So there can be struggle with squares. I actually did a chart for somebody last night. I kid you not, not a single square in the chart to any planet. It was one of the trippiest charts I've ever seen in my life. Not a single square. There were squares to the midheaven and squares to the ascendant, which were different, but no squares to any single planet. It was the cleanest chart I've ever seen. Height pattern, and it was marked by one opposition. One opposition. Now that opposition was kind of intense, it was a, a moon in Scorpio, Neptune and Scorpio conjunction, two degree orb. And on the other side of it was Jupiter in, in um, uh, Taurus. But that's not even a really hard opposition. I mean, anytime you get oppositions with Jupiter, the, the one thing you've got to deal with are too many options or the dispersal of energy and, and having to rein it in. And I'd rather have that than having to break through challenge after challenge after challenge after challenge. This person had earned this chart. In my estimation, they had earned this chart. It was an incredible chart, to be honest with you. But getting back to this whole notion of the square, oh, by the way, 702, I know if you're listening, hang in there. I will, I will get to you. Okay, we'll talk. Just give me a few minutes. So what's happening with the big square, the, the, the outer planet square, is that there's a lot of heavy lifting going on right now here on Earth. Let me tell you, let me just tell you, it is not easy to be here, okay? Right now, it is not easy to be here. This is one of the most, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, it is one of the most challenging places in the universe at this point in time. Because what's happening is, is we're, there is a uh, there is a concentration of energy that is pressing down upon us, and really uh, concentrating our experience into the third dimensional realm. And what I mean by that is, if you look around, just at the activity of the world around us in terms of third dimensional reality, you can see things that are that are compressing our our life force. For instance, the economy. The economy is one of those vices. When I say vice, I don't mean like a like a vice like like beer is a vice or smack is a vice or tobacco is a vice. I'm talking about a vice grip and it's and it's contracting people. And it's contracting people's experience and compressing it. It's making it harder for them to be here. Have you noticed the price of food lately? By the way, I drive a diesel. And the price of diesel fuel is way higher than the price of regular fuel or even premium on leaded fuel. And so what, what, is, what does this mean? How, how does this affect people? Well, the vehicles that drive your goods to market use diesel fuel. And so what happens? What happens is that the, the price of goods rises now because the cost of diesel is uh, prohibitively higher. So he, here's what we've got going. We've got this, this concentration from an economic level on the physical world. It's a compression. And people are feeling it. They're feeling the squeeze. They're feeling the squeeze. We also have other factors that are compressing our experience here outside of the, the economic one, outside of either forced austerity or soft austerity. We also have laws that are 
constricting and contracting our experience here. Just recently, yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a stay on the injunction against the NDAA, and the uh, Obama administration vigorously, and I mean vigorously, fought for this thing to have a stay, which is really um, sad, to be honest with you. Here we had a judge, Judge Forrest, stand up and say, you know what, this is unconstitutional. You basically circumvented the Constitution. This is the one voice of reason I've heard in years, by the way. And she gave her second ruling in four months. And so this has been, this the NDA has been defeated, I believe, four times already. But they come in, they find another judge, Lohire, L-O, it's an interesting name, isn't it, Lohire? You can do the symbolic math on that one. Anyway, Lohire comes in and they says, eh, you know, we got to, you know, we got to allow the uh, administration to do what they're going to do, so let's let's put a stay on that. Pass Judge Forrest on the head. Thank you, Judge Forrest. And you're just going to put a stay on that. And it didn't take long at all. It took just mere days. Days. And Judge Forrest wanted to wait until after Rosh Hashanah, which takes place this weekend in conjunction with the uh, autumnal equinox. But that wasn't soon enough for the administration. They wanted it right now. So what's going to happen is, I think on the 28th of September, uh, right around the last degrees of Saturn and Libra, the anoretic degree, we're going to get a three-panel judge ruling on this. Now, you, you've got to be kidding me. They're just going to load the panel with uh, Obama-appointed judges, and that's it. They will, um, they will codify the NDAA. That's it. Done. To legitimize it. So this is, from a metaphysical perspective, these laws, while in the greater scheme of things, they're not God's law, theoretically. They're man's law. But here we are in this third dimensional cage, and uh, it means something. It has an energetic effect on people in the population at large. So here we have this compression that's taking place from a legal perspective, from an economic perspective. This is a hard, hard place to be in right now. And the square, the outer, the outer planet square is indicative of this because Pluto and Capricorn is the rise of the corporatocracy. That's what Pluto and Capricorn is about. And it happened almost to the day that it went into that sign. Immediately what we had when Pluto went into Capricorn was the bailout. The massive bailout with trillions of dollars left this country. That was Pluto and Capricorn putting its stake in the ground very quickly. Now Uranus and Aries, the, uh, you know, on a on a symbolic level and also on a physical manifest level, is akin to a lot of the conflagrations, the Occupy movement, the, the Arab Springs, all these things. Whether they are real or whether they're manufactured, Uranus and Aries is about that in some ways. But it's also about the individual, and it's about the individual having a radical awakening, a radical awakening around what's happening, what's taking place. The individual snaps out of the trance with, with Uranus and Aries, especially as it slams up against Pluto and Capricorn. And this is where the square is taking place. This is where we are headed right now. It is the mass awakening of the planet going up against the rise of the corporatocracy or the plutocracy, Pluto and Capricorn, taking place before our very eyes. And over the course of the next few days and, and, and a few weeks, we're going to see this clearly, <coughs> excuse me, especially as the equinox and Rosh Hashanah rolls around in just a few days. Very powerful times in terms of planetary events and even personal events. So keep your eyes and your ears open for what's taking place and what's going to take place between now and Sunday. It's a very, very big window on the world stage. We've already 
you know, we're getting numerous reports now out of the uh, Far East where China and Japan are ha having open aggression towards one another. You know, there are these islands that are, you know, being fought over, essentially. The Japanese um, uh, a diplomat, high-ranking Japanese official, was killed. So there's, there's major stuff going on between China and Japan. Now, it could be manufactured. It could be all part of Albert Pike's, you know, magical, dark, magical spell of World War III that could actually be taking place, but there, these things are happening. Also, 40,000 troops have gathered, Indian troops have gathered near the Chinese border. What's that all about? So the signs here, ladies and gentlemen, are fairly ominous. Okay? They're fairly ominous on the outer. Now, if we can buy into the, the notion of as above, so below, there is also a notion as as without so within. So if we if we're experiencing on a collective level all this chaos, all this disorder, all all of this compression, gravity, intensity here in the third dimensional axis on planet Earth, then on an inner plane something else equally powerful and profound is taking place. So what we're here to do today is to try to understand that and to go deeper into that because Scorpio is our gateway. Scorpio is our portal. It's the crack in the world. It is the eighth house where we move from uh, the realm of personal relationships and drop off into the continental shelf or off the continental shelf and into the depth of the psyche. That is Scorpio. And when we deal with Scorpio, what the one thing about Scorpio, and I am the Scorpio rising, and there are times when I cannot control my tongue. Okay, it's just the way it is. It's like zap, you know, zap, out it comes, and um, I wind up, you know, staying somebody, because one of the things that's that that we'll see over the course of the starting right now with Moon and Scorpio, Mars and Scorpio. Uh, the true node, north node, has moved into Scorpio. It's all the Scorpio energy is amassing. And then Saturn moves into Scorpio in October, which is a big shift. What we're going to see <clears throat> during that time <clears throat> there are, it is twofold. One is that we're going to, we're going to witness the darkness revealing itself, both Intentionally and unintentionally. Okay, that's coming. I've talked about this before. I've talked about the externalization of the hierarchy or the revelation of the method. We're going to get more of that with Scorpio. It's just, it's just the way it is. It's coming. We're, the, the hand, the hidden hand will not be so hidden anymore. So we're going to see that, and we're going to see that as, a, as an intentional revelation. But we're also going to see the underbelly. We're going to witness the underbelly of this as well. We're going to witness what happens when things spontaneously wind up erupting. Now, let's just uh, let's buy into this for a second, okay? If if a person lies and begins to tell a series of lies, then what they have to do is they have to continue to tell a bigger lie in order to. Uh, circumvent the other lie that they had previously told. And so what happens is is that as they get further down the the chain of events, in order to prop up the illusion of the lie, the, uh, the, 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 the small lie at the beginning winds up becoming an enormous lie at the end. And so what we're going to be witnessing here, and, and, and it can only, the body can only contain so much in terms of the ability to lie. Unless, of course, you're a full-blown psychopath, in which case that's a whole different story. <laughs> we know that we're dealing with a, a psychopathic intelligence on the planet right now. But what I'm trying to say is, is that there is a point of oversaturation. And then, and then what happens is, is that illusion has no place else to go but to hit a smack in the face. It will be an overflowing of illusion. It will be overflowing of denial. It will be an overflowing of the lie. 
And that's that's where we're headed. And so the the revelations that are going to come as a result of this are not going to be pretty. But at the very least, we'll be able to see them. They will come. They, they will they it will be an empowering moment to not to, to not be in the dark as much. Okay. So just just keep that in mind. Now, I would love to give you a story of feel good right now. I would love to be able to give you the uh, Holy Communion spiritual placebo, the cacao, cacao goji berry spiritual uh, placebo sacrament, put it right on your tongue and just say it's all going to be okay. I'd love to do that. I'm not sure I can. And and I, I don't think I'd be doing you a service by saying that. Now, what I will say is, is that with the infusion of all the scorpionic energy, what we will get, what is available to us as a manifestation of the kind of the greater Godhead, is that we will have an immense ability to endure. We'll have an immense ability to be tough and to hang in there and to be resourceful. Because that's where it's at right now. People need to live, you know, people need to live by their wits. People need to have a sense of resolve. And Scorpio is is about this whole notion of death and, and rebirth. And so dying to the notion of this world that we've lived in or America that we've lived in or the 20th century, you got to die to that. That, that. that world is over. It was over years ago. We're living in a new time and a new place. If you die to it, the faster you die to it, the faster you'll get to the ability to be here now, okay, to be here now. And then you can look around and say, okay, what can I do now? How can I use the tools around me now? What do I need to do to survive? What do I need to do to thrive? What do I need to do to sharpen my psychic abilities? Or what do I need to do to increase my um, vitality? Because Scorpio is sex energy. It's the sacral region. You got to go down into the first chakra, the second chakra. You got to go down into the second chakra over the course of the next two and a half years. It's you know happening right now. So this is what's available to everybody. And once we get into it, then we can begin to transform our lives. And as we transform our lives, then we can transform uh, our families and our communities. And once once we transform those, then we can transform the world around us. And here we are right now. It's a big change. It's a really big change. Hold on to your horses. Because uh, you know, we're in big boy and big girl times. Adolescence on this planet is over. All right. Let's take a call. Somebody's been waiting patiently here to chat and maybe uh, do a chart. Let's find out who they are and what they want to talk about. Hello there. Hello? Hi. Hello there. Hi. Um, I just noticed that you, what you're talking about, it's all true. Like the energy right now is really, really off. It's, I, I've been feeling really weird lately. How would you describe that? How would you describe that? How, like, it, how do you, um, the energy is really intense, mm-hmm. you know? Like it feels like things are... Like, just like a Scorpio. You know how a Scorpio is very, very intense? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the energy um, during this time is very intense. Sure is. Hey, can you do me a favor? Could you just turn your uh, speaker down a little bit? Speaker down a little bit. Sorry. Sorry about that. I like listening to myself talk, like but not that much. I like listening to myself talk, but not that much. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Let me turn that no off for you. Ah, wait, my phone is acting up. <laughs> okay. Okay, is that better? Let me see. Yeah, a lot better. What's your name? Uh, okay, my name's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Where are you calling from? Um, Las Vegas. Okay. So, um, you're feeling the intensity, uh, and mm-hmm. and I think it's important to be able to acknowledge that. You know, I think it's really important to acknowledge that because a lot of people would just kind of, you know, move on. We, we live these really busy lives, 
and we get caught up in, you know, having to pay this bill or be this place to get our kid or, you know, or, or go to this job interview in order to make a little extra money. And those things are all really important. But I think we're at a, at a point in our history where people have to sit back and notice and not deny what's taking place right now. So, you know, props to you for doing that and being aware of that. What is your sign? Uh, I'm I'm an Aquarius. Okay. Uh, so one I of the guess things, that explains it, right? Well, I think Aquarians have a great ability to um, have 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 a, have a have a larger sort of sense of objectivity. And by the way, Aquarius is a very interesting relationship with Scorpio. It is the alchemical um, adjunct to Scorpio because when you look at Scorpio, Scorpio is the it's the uh, it's the it's the serpent or the snake, and, uh, and Aquarius is theoretically and symbolically the eagle. So what we have together is uh, is instinct transforming into vision, which is Aquarius. The, the flag of Mexico is symbolic of that. So and they're both fixed signs, obviously, but there is a connection there between Scorpio and Aquarius. Aquarius is the objectivity to kind of experience and feel the intensity and the depth. And so the whole concept or notion between bringing these two things into balance is to uh, marry uh, instinct and vision at the same time. So that's kind of the goal of an Aquarius is to, because Aquarians can live in their ivory towers, right? They can just, you know, remove themselves from the world and sit back and, you know, kind of contemplate on, you know, or comment on how things are going. And Scorpio can get so subjectively engaged in their uh, inner life and sort of lose the forest for the trees. But when the two come together, it's kind of the, the alchemical marriage. So you're you're part of the you're part of the equation and maybe part of the solution. Do you want me to uh, look at your chart? Sure, why not? Okay. Um, let's get your. Uh, let me get a good. Do I want to get this? Let's get your. Boom. See this. All right, when is your birthday? February 4th, 1987. Okay. Uh, so you are part of the Pluto and Scorpio generation. So you would definitely have uh, a connection to the intensity. What time were you born? 10.35 a.m. Okay. And where was that? Uh, Cebu, Philippines. Okay. Now how do you spell Cebu? C-E-B-U. C-E-B-U. Okay. There it is. All right. Okay, so how much do you know about your chart? Uh, not much at all. All I know, I think I know uh, that it only stays on like one side or something. I yeah, you are, all I know about you are completely above the horizon. So um, the only thing, so the only thing that you have below the horizon is Chiron in Gemini in the second house, which is not really all that grounding, to be honest with you. And you don't have, well, I, I take that back. You have. Neptune and Capricorn, but that is the only Earth sign um, that you that you have in your chart. You might have one of the most ungrounded charts I've ever looked at. <laughs> are you out there? Are you, are you like are you like really out there? Yeah, I'm really eccentric. I'm a really eccentric person. Why? Like, why do you think I'm into all this spiritual stuff? Yeah, that's pretty. It's pretty clear with this chart. Okay, so. You're a classic. You're a classic transpersonal personality, and what I mean by that is, is that as an individual, in some ways, you don't even exist. Okay, you know, you transpersonal personalities are very attuned to the world around them, to the collective, collective energies. They feel things at a collective level. So when we, when, we, when you said, yeah, I can feel the intensity, I can feel that the energy is off. Well, it's, it's it's easy for you to do that because of who you are. You know, you, you are not necessarily here for your own life. You're here for some greater purpose. You're here to experience um, 
life at a, at a, at a maximal level. And the, the, the collective can enter through you and you can enter back into the collective. And it's hard sometimes because with, with that kind of personality and no earth in your chart, you don't always have like a clear sense of direction and not always knowing what to do because all these, uh, you know, sort of titanic forces are working through your life uh, on you and not and through you, but not necessarily always for you. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, what are we to derive from this? How can you make sense out of your life? What can you do in order to really, you know, grab grab hold of it and have an experience that's meaningful? Well, I look at your son. It's in Aquarius. It's in the tenth house, and people that have son in the tenth house. Are are fair? They're they they're pretty prominent personalities. They have very uh, very strong signatures that they imprint uh, upon people around them, and not just people around them, but also the world. There's a a sense of uh, of, of destiny with people that have tenth house sons that they need to be public figures in some way to really fulfill who they are. Okay, so part of whatever it is you you are going to do in this lifetime, you must do it in front of people. You must have a stage. I think Oprah Winfrey is an Aquarius. <laughs> Oprah is definitely an Aquarius. Yeah. So maybe she needs a, you know, replacement sometime down the line. Maybe that's you. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I just agree with your ungrounded thing. Like, but because it seems like I can never stay in one place. Yeah. Maybe that has something to do with my ungroundedness. <laughs> Yeah, I can well, never stay in one place. You have no earth in your chart. You're, you know, your air and your fire and your some water. You've got Mercury and Pisces, which makes it's at zero degrees Pisces, by the way, which makes uh-huh. you incredibly psychic and very open to suggestion. You know, Mercury and Pisces is very, very fluid and very sensitive and, and picks up. Um, perceptions and feelings and stuff. Have you ever gotten into, like, psychic work at all? No. You should study it. I always play around with tarot cards, though. Okay, fine. Here's what I would do if I were you, okay? I would find myself a really good psychic teacher. And I'm not, I, I mm-hmm. find somebody who is very grounded, okay? You, you know, it's very important mm-hmm. that you find a grounded person. I was lucky enough to find a super grounded person when I started to get into this who really helped me. And um, open sort of my third eye, uh, or see through my third eye. But you have pronounced psychic ability. You have Mercury and Pisces, zero degrees, and um, it uh, trines Pluto and Scorpio. So, you know, Mercury trining Pluto gives you the opportunity and the ability to experience extreme depth and perception in your mental process. Uh, but it, it, That's really the, funny. Why? Because I have an uncle who's really, really good at reading tarot cards. He's extremely accurate. Well, extremely you, accurate. You would, you would make a, you'd be, if you could awaken your psychic abilities and do it in a way, or, or work with somebody who's really trustworthy and grounded and solid. Um, you have tremendous potential in that realm. Okay, and um, your moon. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, da, 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 da. What else is Mercury doing? It's got that trine. Uh, it's sextiles Venus and sextiles Uranus in your chart. So using your brain is really important, but you you need to use your brain in an unconventional way. You're not you're not meant in, to work in a, in a traditional fashion in this lifetime. You're just not. You know, any any kind of, like, traditional um, nine-to-five job. Is job not gonna bores work. you, right? It's not going to work for you. It bores me. It's not going to work. <laughs> it you're bores not, me. You're not here for that. So what I would do is I would find somebody that I can study with and apprentice uh, right now because Saturn is moving into uh, Scorpio. So what's going to happen is, is that you're going to have uh, this year – Saturn jump on your Pluto in the seventh house. Two things are going to occur. Number one, by the way, your sun squares Pluto, right? So what what was I talking about when we first started uh, our discussion on the phone or on the show today? 
I was talking about this marriage between the eagle and the serpent, right? Aquarius mm-hmm. and Scorpio. Here in your chart, you have a classic square, Sun Pluto, Aquarius, Scorpio. You know, you're here to connect this notion of instinct with vision. That's important. You've got to figure this out, okay? And Saturn mm-hmm. on your Pluto, which is happening this year, will make that very clear. Any relationship that you've got in your life right now will undergo serious transformation. And there are going to be people, like if you're in a relationship right now with somebody, you're going to experience some very intense moments in that relationship, almost like life and death moments. Like, you know, if I have to let go of this relationship, I'm going to die. And I I don't mean physically, I mean metaphorically. You know, or the person that you're involved with, where'd you go? Oh, wow, man, that's a bummer. It's just rolling. Are you there? No. Anyway, I hate that. Come on, Blog Talk. Help me out here. Oh, uh, sorry, I got dropped. That's okay. So anyway, what you, you know, you're you're going to be experiencing a nexus point in relationships. I don't know what's going on. If you've got somebody in your life or not. If you don't, uh, then there's a, a potential, very strong potential, that you would have a meeting with somebody, which is what I would call a relationship of destiny. And that relationship potentially has has the potential to ignite this connection between your son up in the 10th house. And get I already you- have, though. I, already, I just recently met him, very recently. Okay. All right, so here's the deal, all right? I'm not a doom and gloom and fatalistic astrologer, but any time Saturn crosses Pluto in a chart, tremendous change takes place. Tremendous. Like, I'm not talking minor fractional change. I'm talking wholesale change. So one of two things will happen with this relationship. You will It will either end suddenly or you will just say, screw it, let's get married, and then bang, you're there. Something dramatic will happen with this relationship that will change your life and it will change your perception of who you are and why you're here. Okay, It's important. And at the same time, um, Saturn um, in, in, in Scorpio will be trining your Mercury in Pisces. So you're also going to be forced into grounding and focusing this kind of um, very wide broadcast signal that you have in your chart, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's coming. The other thing that you've got going on is you've got Neptune right on your Mercury in Pisces, you know, and so you've got this interesting Neptune on Mercury, Neptune uh, trining Pluto. Like this really should be one of the most profound times of your life if you're open and awake to it. And what you want to do, and this is this is one of my analogies that I use with uh, astrology. Uh, astrology is like cycles and waves. And right now you're you're in a you're off the coast of uh, of Maui doing big wave surf. And you got a longboard and you got you got to surf this big wave because you got a big wave in your life right now. So your you know your your mission is to, to to catch that wave and go as far with it as possible. So you need to open yourself to the potential of really expanding your mind and expanding what you, what how you how you define things like the energy is off. I can really feel it. Okay. It's really weird because I've been really getting, lately, I've just been really getting into the spiritual stuff. Yeah, that's it. Like, really into it. That's it. This is like Neptune. I just feel different. Yeah, this is Neptune on your Mercury. So go far, go deep, go wide. You know, this is your time for that. And and what you, it's very important because you don't have any earth in your chart. You must be grounded with this kind of work. Okay. So I am a big believer that um, in order to have really safe and grounded psychic experiences, you must also build your faith. You must have a very strong spiritual base. 
And when I say spiritual, I mean you've got you've got to get to God, okay? You've got to be able to say to God first, you know, I'm turning this moment over to you. I'm turning this experience over to you. I'm turning this reading over to you. I can of my own self do nothing. That that kind of language. And to ask for grounding, please ground me and protect me as I open myself to uh, to uh, inspiration and intuition and the knowing that I need to experience for this person or for this time. So here's your homework, okay? And I'm going to jump off okay. the stack up here. Here's your homework. Mm-hmm. I want. I I think it would be very valuable for you to take this feeling of something's off, right? And then get more focused with that. Why? Why is it off? What can you derive from that feeling? And here's here's how you can do it. At some point, find some quiet time and relax and meditate. Say a little prayer for protection. And then you don't necessarily just put your finger on a, a pen and a piece of paper and have somebody else move it. But what would be very interesting for you is to get into sort of a stream of consciousness and to focus on this off feeling and just begin to write or sketch or draw what comes to you as a result of the feeling. And don't judge whatever it is that you're writing or sketching or drawing. You just want to let it come through, okay? Okay. And then after that, you can look at it and you can say, oh, uh, I just I just drew like a bowling ball and bowling pins. And what the hell does that mean, right? So then you've got to figure out, okay, okay, kingpin, kingpin. I mean, so there's there's a way. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to establish a link between the language of the unconscious, which I think you have a very strong uh, opening to, and the ability to articulate that. That's your homework. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thanks for calling in. Call back sometime, okay? I think you've got a minute. Okay, I will. All right? <laughs> because I got the, I've, I've got the most ungrounded chart you've ever seen. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Call, call right, back. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. See you later. I know. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. It takes one ungrounded person to know another, to be honest with you. My chart is kind of like that. I only have one planet, really. You can, I guess you can count Chiron. But I only have one planet below the horizon. I've got Saturn and Capricorn. Yeah, I guess maybe Jupiter and Sag in the first house. But that's money chart in a nutshell. All right. So I see Dave. Dave, I'm going to get to you, okay? You're you're on my list. But I'm going to go to, let's see, this uh, person here has been waiting for six minutes. They're calling from the 631 area code. Hello there. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure, who's this? Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Where are you calling from? Long Island. Hey, what's going on out there in the Hamptons? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got a funny little okay. story about my life in Long Island. Uh, do you want to hear it? Okay. My uh, my family, my family history, my family owned the um, the house that was the Amityville Horror, <laughs> which is out there in Long Island. So that house, what they made the movie about, was in my family at one point in time. It's one of my few claims to fame, and it's not a very, uh, it's an infamous claim to fame. So, okay. and anyway, that's my Long Island connection, the Amityville Horror. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you want to look at today, Suzanne? A couple of things. Um, I need a job, and tomorrow I'm going for an interview. At 12.30, and I was wondering if you see me getting it. Okay. When is your birthday? 10, 5, 60. Okay. So you're a rat. It should be a good year for you. I'm a rat, too, by the way. Same year. What time were you born? I think 7.25 a.m., something like that. Okay. 7.25. And Where? Huntington, New York. Okay, let's see. There you go. New York, yes. All right. 
Okay, so um, tomorrow ten twenty five, right? What kind of job is it? Teacher aid. Teacher aid. Yes. Yes, I, I, I yes. My, my, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'll tell you why. Um, you have Saturn and Capricorn, uh, and that's in the third house. Okay. And, the, and you also have Jupiter down there in Sagittarius. Our charts are very similar. I'm, I'm born the 22nd of September, not too far away from when you were born. Um, so you have Jupiter and Sagittarius. And the, both of those plants are in the third house. And the third house is all about, like, early childhood education, you know, K through, like, um, 12, really. Um, so you are, you know, with those two planets um, – in those houses, you're, you're, I mean, in those two plants in that house, you are naturally set up to do that. And in fact, um, Jupiter trines your moon in Aries, and it also trines uh, Uranus uh, up in the 11th house in your chart in Leo. So you have a grand trine, you have a grand fire trine. And I think that you would not only be a, a very good addition to the school, the classroom, that you'd be in, but you also have on a temporary basis, but you also have the potential to actually turn this into a longer term career. Um, if you choose to do that, the key for you is about, um, the key is, uh, enthusiasm, enthusiasm. And I think you have a great deal of enthusiasm when you can, when you tap into it. And let me just check out the ephemeris for tomorrow, find out what's happening. We've got a change in, the moon, it goes into Sagittarius. It won't be that far into Sagittarius so that it will conjunct your Jupiter, which would be kind of ideal. But uh, Friday, let's see, tomorrow, let's see, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the moon will be close to your Jupiter and Sag, which means that, uh, you know, you could receive notice that you had been hired on Friday with Jupiter, uh, with the moon conjuncting Jupiter, which would be wonderful for you. So you know when you would start? When you would start for yeah. the job? Uh, I would say fairly soon uh, because, again, Moon would be conjuncting Jupiter. You could start as, as early as next week. Well, I don't think they would start that soon. It has to go in front of the board or something, I think. I don't know. It's, you know, things happen very quickly. You know, the Moon is trining Uranus. You're going to have a Moon-Moon trine. It's very accelerated. It's extremely accelerated. Now, if you if you – want to go further out and get into the Scorpio piece, um, you're going to have Saturn conjuncting your Mercury in October. So you're going to have a Saturn-Mercury conjunction, a Saturn-Neptune conjunction. All those happen in October, November, December. And that for you is going to be very powerful. It's going to have you uh, uh, really refocus your identity and use your use your mind and um, use your ability and skills to communicate in a very focused and direct fashion. So, what about a boyfriend? When do you see a boyfriend coming in? Oh, a boyfriend. Well, okay. Uh, you've got Moon in in uh, in, in uh, Aries, and Uranus is coming up. Let's see. Uranus is at uh, let's see eight degrees. Um, is Saturn I, moving out too? Uh, Saturn. Saturn is in your first house. Saturn's what? away. From Saturn is away is, is away from your sun, which is in the twelfth house. Saturn's in your first house now, and the thing about Saturn in the first house, and I've seen this, uh, is that people that have a first house Saturn transit need they need to focus on themselves, and not in a selfish way, but in a way that's like right here, immediate, here and now, and because the first house is the house of self, and a lot of times if they wind up getting into a relationship. While Saturn is transiting the first house, they will miss the immediacy of the first house transit. I would, I would wait. I would wait until, uh, well. Well, I'm Saturn, sort of. I Saturn, sort of like different people now. So yeah, Saturn needs to cross your Venus, which is at 10 degrees in Scorpio in your first house. When that? that? That will be in Oct uh, November, December. I think it's in November. Hold on, let me just get my ephemeris out. Yeah, hold on. 
Because one of the things that Saturn, uh, the Saturn Venus conjunction brings people are relationships of destiny, but it also brings compression in relationship. So you become very selective about who you're with when Saturn conjuncts Venus, especially in the first house. So you mean the people I'm dating now are not it, or maybe will there be a relationship with them in November, December, or? Saturn uh, hits. Let's see, nine degrees in Scorpio in December, ten degrees in Scorpio in January. Um, you have an Aries moon, and uh, and it's in the seventh house, which can be a little. Uh, how how do I say this without without um, without how do I say this in a way that's going to honor you? Uh, when you have Moon trying Uranus and Moon trying Jupiter, having a conventional monogamous one-on-one relationship with one person is challenging, okay? Because you because you need to be stimulated with that moon. You know, Aries moon is a hot moon. It's a passionate moon. And it doesn't really sit still, especially when it trines Uranus. If anything, the type of relationship that would be uh, interesting for you are very unconventional relationships. You know, people outside of your social circle or people outside of your uh, age bracket. These are the types of relationships. Yeah, you're right, but the, the person I like, he's too young, so it's not going anywhere, but I find him attractive and I find him smart, but then I, somebody else likes him and I'm thinking, oh, I'll just go with him because it's more, maybe there'll be a relationship and then there's someone else. <laughs> it's like, I don't well, know. Well, that's, that's part of it. I mean, that's part of your dilemma with your chart. I mean, I don't, your chart is very challenging for commitment. I'm just going to be upfront with you, okay? Because I, can. Of that. I just have to find the right person. Well, wait till Saturn hits your Venus. When's that? It, it's in January. But how about you, before that? It means that I'm not going to date got, before you've then? Got, you've got, I mean, you can play around and have fun. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that you, you can't do that. But you've got some major uh, aspects that are coming at you. You've got Saturn conjuncting Mercury, Saturn conjuncting Neptune, Saturn conjuncting Venus. All this is, is happening before the end of the year. We're talking a major overhaul of your personality and how you project yourself to the world. That's but coming. You, you see someone coming in then for a serious relationship? I, I would I, I would say that by by January, what will happen is is that you will get very focused on what you want and the type of person that will um, float your boat. Okay, you need somebody to be quite honest with you, that can ring your bell sexually and at the same time keep you uh, engaged and entertained and stimulated. But there's also a spiritual element that's, that's involved here because of the Neptune and Venus conjunction. Saturn will distill that and will show you how important that is. Look, you're going to have Pluto on Saturn, your own Saturn in your third house in 2013. It's one of the major transits of your life, Okay. So anything that you're doing now or anybody that you're seeing now, because Saturn, by the way, squares your moon and squares your sun. They've so got what does that mean? Well, that means that, that, that everything up until like 11 degrees uh, of Pluto in 2013, That's because that's where it gets. I think Pluto actually gets to 12 degrees in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. I know it gets to 11 because it hits my Saturn. Anything that happens before then, may not make it through that Pluto-Saturn conjunction. And it may not make it through the Saturn-Venus conjunction. And what does remain through those conjunctions, that's when you know you've got the right person, okay? Whoever is standing after those conjunctions, that's your man. You mean after January? After January and even further and deeper into 2013. Look, here's, here's if you really want my advice, you, and you called me here for my advice, my advice to you is to focus on who you are right now with Saturn in your first house. I already know, you know who I am. I'm looking for a companion. Okay. Yeah. Well, the comp- I'm going I'm to tell you right now, the companion piece is not going to be solidified until Saturn hits your Venus and Pluto hits your Saturn. And you, can, and you can play around, you can fool around, and you can have fun. But until those aspects occur, you're not going to have, you know, a solidification in those areas of your life. These are okay. two, two major main- these are two these are two major aspects. You know, you're dealing with Scorpio. You're dealing with the energy of Scorpio, and you don't necessarily have a say in it. It's gonna it's gonna work you, and you're gonna have to surrender. 
So you play around, enjoy it, have fun, but really focus on kind of your own personal needs and allow the energy to literally sort of eliminate the pretenders from the contenders. Now, do you see marriage at all in 2013 then? Uh, mm, eh, possibly. I mean, you've got Jupiter and Gemini in your eighth house, so there's potential. Um, I just I, – I, here's, here's what I see. I see that you have a moment at the beginning of the year where you assess who you're with at that time. And you become very, very clear about what's important because Saturn on your Venus, what it does, is it eliminates the dross from your life. Okay. And so you just take the checklist. No, 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 yes. And it will be an unequivocal yes. There will be no vacillating, okay? But you have to wait until at least after January until you get all the information and all the experience in. All right? Can I just one more quick, quick question? Do you see my son moving back in with me? He's only 11. He lives with his dad now. What's his sign? Uh, Pisces. He's going to be 12 uh, February 20th. 12 February 20th. Um, let's see. You've got Chiron in the fifth house, and it's in Aquarius, but it's at the edge of Aquarius. Um Uh, to be honest with you, uh, because the fifth house is generally, what sign is his father? Leo. Uh, he's a Pisces. And you're, I would say that based on uh, Saturn and Scorpio, that the chances are much better than they've been. Really? Yeah. Yeah. But when? What, what month? Um, I would look towards March. That soon? Well, you're asking me. I mean, that would be great, but I don't know how that would happen. But in I, March? I, if, I, I mean, if it's going to happen, it would happen in March. Really? No, I'm, bull- we- I'm bullshitting you. Of course. Really. Yes, I'm, that's why I'm saying it. <laughs> He's just going to leave the school he's at in March, though, because he doesn't go. I'm sorry, if you you ask me a question, if it's going to happen, the potential would be in March. Again, here, hear me out, all right? Just look, you need to wait until Saturn goes through your first house, Mercury, Neptune, and Venus. Okay, you're not done. You're not cooked. You've got I feel to make, like I am. Well, you're not. Okay, I'm telling you, you got a process to go through. I know it. I've been through it. I've been through the Saturn. Mercury conjunction, the Saturn uh, Venus conjunction, I'm about to go through the Saturn Neptune conjunction, things get very concentrated and focused. Now, I may be wrong, and you can call me back six months from now and say, hey, look, I got married, I got the job, I got my kid, and, you know, whatever. I'm just, you, you call Wait me Wait a minute, up, you, you said giving, I was going to get you, all I'm that. Giving you, I'm giving you my advice, you asked for my advice, and what I'm yeah. trying to share with you is that you're in a process, and until, the, and until Saturn moves across those planets, and Pluto moves across Saturn in your chart, the process is incomplete. And, if, and with Saturn in your first house, the most important thing to do is to focus on your own internal process and power and, and, to, and, to, and to concentrate that. Now, you, the rest is up to you, okay? I, 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 know I'm doing, I do my best to give you uh, the, the probability. I give my, the dynamics and what can take place. And... The okay, rest so is you, you and God, okay? No, I know that, but you're, you're saying that you see, like, maybe a relationship getting better in January, like a, a real um, one. What, what I'm saying is is that when Saturn is on your Venus, you will distill the candidates as to who you can be with, okay? You will understand what's important to you at a deep and fundamental level, okay? Yes. That will be apparent for you. Great. You, okay, and your Mark- room- your moon in Aries dancing around with Uranus and Jupiter is going gonna, is, is gonna to take a break for a while because you're going to get very clear about what's important. And the same thing with my son in March, if he comes back, it would I be I think then. March, if, it, if, if he's going to come back, March is the best. It's got, it's got the best probability for the, because your fifth house is ruled by Pisces. 
okay? Which means that children, your child, your son, shows up in your fifth house. All right, and then about the job that would be now. Your son shows up in your fifth house. And the, and, and the time where it could happen would be in March, which would be the solar return, which would be closest to the Saturn Sun trine, with Saturn being in your first house, Scorpio being the procreative energy which brought your son into this world. So you asked me a question. Based on the, the, the geometry of your chart, that is the best probability for his return if he's going to return. Okay? After that, I don't know. That's okay. No, I'm just asking. All right. And I'll probably get the job then tomorrow. It'll be great. Work one thing at a time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Welcome. Bye-bye. Hey. I need to take a break. <laughs> Sorry. Let me play a little music. 484, Dave, hang in there. I just need to take a break. need to breathe a little bit. That was an interesting reading, wasn't it? Uh, let me play a little bit of music. And um, I will um, come back here and hang out with the rest of you for the next uh, 52 minutes on navigating the astrological matrix. Me, your host, Robert Phoenix. What am I going to play? Uh, how about sound vibrations? I haven't played this in a while. Uh, this is uh, from yours truly, Bob and Matrix. And I'll be back in five minutes and four seconds. One of nature's greatest wonders is the ability of the human ear to distinguish among the millions of sounds around us. Listen. You will hear later how these characteristics are determined by the frequency, intensity, and form of sound waves in the air.
It's these vibrations which your brain interprets as sound. That was Sound Vibrations by yours truly. It's uh, 11.13. We've got uh, 45 minutes, 46 minutes, 26 seconds to be on exact left in today's show. You're listening to Navigating the Astrological Matrix. Let's take our next caller. Hi there. Thanks for waiting. Hi. 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 Thanks for taking my call. No worries. Um, Yes. I wanted to ask you, my name is Sonetta, and I wanted to ask you, when do you see Danny uh, physically coming to see me or physically taking me out on a physical date? (laughs) So you just want Danny to get physical with you? Well, you know, we're dating, but we had a little bit of a fallout in early August. I ran the whole thing into a ditch, and uh, we're back to communicating and texting each other because he works 70 hours a week, so we can really only text message each other. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, you know, that's going pretty solid for the last two weeks. We've been really getting in some good conversation, but every time I ask him, you know, when are we going to go to the movies or when are we going to hang out? And he says, I don't know yet. So mm-hmm. I need to know for my own personal sanity, mm-hmm. is he going to take me out anymore or is he saying I don't know yet because he don't want to be bothered? But then again, if he didn't want to be bothered, why would he be engaging in all of these deep mm-hmm. text messaging? And, you know, we text from like, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night until midnight, one in the morning. And, mm-hmm. you know, time is very valuable to him. So if he didn't want anything to do with me, I don't think he would be wasting what little time he has to himself texting me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, here's what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to look at your chart, and I'm going to – um ask you what Danny's sun sign is. But before okay. I but, but hold on. Before I do that, here's what I want you to do. All right? I want you to close your eyes. Can you close your eyes for me? Yep. Yeah. All right, close your eyes and just just take a nice deep breath, okay? Take a nice deep breath. I'll take it with you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. I want you, right now in this moment, to ask yourself the question that you're asking me. Okay. All right. I want you to ask yourself the question that you're asking me. Why Danny does not appear to you more in the physical? And just close your eyes and ask yourself. Ask yourself that question. And what okay. Answer, what answer are you getting? He feels... Um, I think he feels that I'm too aggressive. I'm too forceful. I'm too um, strong and stuff like that for him. Like, you know, like I'm a very aggressive, assertive, independent type of woman. And I'm feeling when you when you told me to do that exercise, I'm feeling that I'm coming at him too strong. Okay. So with that knowledge in mind. The, the, now that you've just experienced that, if you mm-hmm. backed if you backed off a little bit, that's what and, I've been doing, and gave him the space to come in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you think that he would then occupy that space and meet you? I'm hoping so, but a part of me feels like, am I wasting my time? Okay. All right. Let's do that. Let's do the same thing again. Ready? Ready? Mm -hmm. Close your eyes one more time. Right. Take that that deep breath. Here we go. (sighs) Ask yourself the question, are you wasting your time? Um, I'm feeling that I'm not wasting my time. Okay. That's important. From, From him, from him, from waiting from him. Okay, that's important because you have to trust yourself, right? Yes. You have to trust yourself. So 
let's buy into the fact right now that you had an honest moment. You had an honest okay. moment with yourself, and you have come to the conclusion that you're not wasting your time. Okay. Can we agree on that? Yeah. All right. Now that you've come to that, uh, you've arrived at that conclusion, don't ever go back and think that thought again. Okay. That you are not wasting your time, that you, that for whatever reason, for how whatever uh, meaning or purpose or feeling you have, you've determined that you love this man. Okay. Okay. Don't question it from this okay. point forward. Because you've just said no, you're not wasting your time. Get right. off the get off the fence with that. Okay. Now here's here's the next part of that, okay? That doesn't mean that it's going to turn out the way that you want. But at least, and I'm not saying it will or it won't, because we're gonna get into the chart. But what you've now done is you've committed to the fact that we've we we've uncovered two things. One, that you might be too aggressive and that he may need a little more space in order to occupy and fill that space. And two, that you're not wasting your time. These are two very important things that at the end of this conversation that it, that it would be, I think, meaningful for you to walk away with. Don't question whether you're wasting your time now. You've determined that. Okay. Okay, wh when is your birthday? Um, my birthday is 8-29-74, okay. and I have his birthday too. Let me get your uh, – so 8, that's uh, – August 29th, 1974. Yeah, I'm and, a Virgo. Uh-huh. And, and um, what, what time were you born? 2 p.m. And where? Philadelphia, PA. Okay. All right, so let me look at your chart. Okay, all right. Just tell me his sign. What's his sign? He's a cancer. Okay. All right, and um, when is his birthday? 7-8-76. All right, uh, so sun is at 15 degrees, Cancer, and you have Saturn in Cancer in your chart at 15 degrees. So what you have here is you have an exact conjunction between your Saturn and his sun, okay? Okay. Now, um, that is often considered a relationship of destiny, and and he, but it's tricky. It, it's tricky for the following reasons. Number one, your Saturn in Cancer is in your eighth house. Okay. And, and the eighth house is the house of Scorpio. So the eight, so there are two houses where, where things are really kind of occluded. The 12th house, the house of Pisces, and the 8th house, the house of Scorpio, things take place beneath the surface. They're not visible. They're not always – you can't always put your finger on them and, and reach into them and say, ah, the, this is where this person dwells. I can okay. see this person. They're in my 5th house, my 5th house of romance. Or they're in my 3rd house, and we go to school together. Or they're in my 10th yes. house, and we work together. The 8th house is the house of, of the psyche. The eighth house is the house of archetypal uh, symbolism. And so his son, his solar signature, who he is, is going to be hidden from you in the rest of your chart. Okay? So one, right. of the, one of the more challenging things around this is to get a definite answer. Right? It's, right. A, very, it's a very challenging thing. Now, I'm going to tell you that this guy's not going anywhere that this is a relationship of destiny, okay? It's a relationship of destiny. You know what? It, it's funny that you said this because I have known him since I was 10 years old. We lived four doors away from each other. Mm -hmm. I've known him all my life. He's been on my Facebook page as my friend. 
Mm-hmm. But he had a steady girlfriend for five years. Yeah. They broke up. They broke up in February. He moved out. I ran into him in June of this year, and we were talking. And I was, you know, complaining about men or relationships. And he goes, yeah, I hear you, man. I, I know because I, you know, I'm single too. And I was like, what do you mean? You mm-hmm. and Jessica broke up? He's like, yeah, I moved down in February, and I'm living by myself. And then mm-hmm. something told me in my gut to message him on Facebook and to say, you know what, let's go, let's go, let's go watch a movie or something. Let's go hang out. He mm-hmm. started texting me. We started dating. We started mm-hmm. seeing each other. We started yeah. on a romantic level now. Mm-hmm. And then I threw everything in the ditch by accusing him, saying, you know what, I, I think you might be cheating on me. I think that you might be at the bar. I think you might be doing this. I think you might be doing that. And mm-hmm. that's all I would text to him. And he finally said, I've been telling you and telling you and telling you to stop doing this. And in August, he said, you know what, I can't do this no more. I, I can't. I can't. One minute you're nice. The next minute you're mean. Back and forth, you don't want me, you do want me, you don't want me, you do want me. You think I'm doing this when I'm not. You think I'm doing that when I'm not. Even though I tell you I'm not doing it, you're thinking something different. You're texting me. I can't text you fast enough. You're getting mad. You get mad when when I don't take you out. I can't do nothing right. I can't make you happy, and I can't. So well, honey, part so, of- right, so let's, let's, let's put, so this is everything that he's saying, right? Yes. Well, how do you how do you yes. feel about that when he when he shares that with you? Well, I I I I have been looking at this and saying, yeah, that's that's what I've done. So most of August, our communication has been really really strained. Mm-hmm. But in the last two weeks, he has really opened up to me. Like before, after you know he broke it off with me, mm-hmm. I would say to him, hi. He would say, hey, and then that's all you're getting from him for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. I could say I fell and broke my neck. He would not respond. But then two weeks ago, things got turned around a little bit, and we started talking, and, you know, I would tell him, you know, I think that you're scared. Yeah, 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 Jose, and I can handle you. And he's engaging in the conversation. But like I said, I said to him last weekend, you know, do you want to go to the movies or do something? And he goes, I don't know yet. Mm-hmm. And then I said to him, Danny, are you interested in someone else? And he said no. Okay. So here's the deal. All right. Here's, if you, here, here's my prescription. Here's Dr. Bob's prescription. You ready? Yeah. All right. This is coming from a man and an yeah. astrologer. Okay. Uh, give Danny a little space. You know, just tell Danny, say, Danny, you know, I just want to let you know I'm here for you. And and have a lighter touch with the texting. And have a lighter touch with the um, the accusational components with the, the you know, with, with, with his character or what he's doing. Because what people don't like is they don't, especially men, is they they you've got to leave an out for a man, okay? There ha- it's 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 about saving face, and, okay. and and men need to in some ways. That doesn't mean you have to excuse what men do or don't do, but get, allowing a man to have some dignity and to save face in moments and to not feel like he is being, um, ha- you know, hounded. Or, or he's being um, upbraided, or you know, you've got to, you've got to give him a little bit of latitude, and because this is a guy that's just come out of a long-term relationship, and he's just finding himself, okay? So, right, and then he meets up with me, who he's known all my life, and here I am. Right, and so, but, but, but know that this is a relationship of destiny. You can't get away from it. It's Saturn on the sun. It's you know. That's interesting because you have Jupiter in the third house in Pisces, so this texting thing uh, would be very, very kind of appropriate for your chart. And Jupiter opposes Mars and Virgo uh, up in the ninth house. And Mars and Virgo is very critical, by the way. 
you know. And so what happens is he's not in the physical for you, and you're just solely in that Jupiterian Piscean text realm in the third house. You'll get a little you get a little skitty because of the opposition. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that in 2013 Jupiter will move into your eighth house, and you will okay. have a conjunct, you will have a conjunction in, between Jupiter and Saturn in Cancer. His sun will be there, and this is in the latter part of 2013, all right? So all, what you want to do is you want to get there. You want to get to that point where Jupiter moves into your eighth house. What was that? Was that a UFO? Yeah. Um, so, so what I'm so, asking you is when do yeah. you physically see him taking me out again? Is it going to be a couple more weeks? Or what? Well, here's what I would here's what I would say. You've got Mars uh, in Virgo. It's at 20 degrees. The sun is in Virgo right now. It's what is it at 17, 18 degrees? You know, okay. I would say I would say there's a very good possibility that he could take you out this weekend. Really? Yeah, really. But now, order, do, now, do I w- listen? Listen, do I yeah. wait for him? to text me and say, hey, what are you doing Saturday night? Because I'm done done saying let's go to the movies or let's go jump rope or whatever. I'm done trying to give him ideas. Right. Where do you live? I live in the same town as him in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on a second. Here's what I'm going to – okay, let me do one thing here. Do you really want to go out with this guy? Yeah. All right, all right. Here's what you do. Hold on. I'm gonna tell you right now. Yeah, but he keeps saying I don't know yet. What is that? What does that mean when he says I don't know yet? Is he uh, is he just he's being trying a nice to, guy because trying, he, he doesn't know. want to say no? Yeah, he's trying to gain trust in you. That's what he's trying to do. So he's, are you saying that he's not saying I don't know yet because he really means no, but he don't want to hurt your feelings? Here's what I would do. You ready? No, it's not about that. He likes you. This is You can't get away from the relationship because of the Saturn-Sun conjunction, but you kind of blew him out of the water by making all these accusations. So right. know, that, that's kind of a scorched earth policy. So now you've got to wait for the, uh, you've got to wait for the forest to grow back a little bit. So here's what I would well, do. Well, it's, it's, it's been a month and a half since he's taken ready? me out. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, you really ready for this? Yeah. I would, I would get – Two tickets to the Braves versus the Phillies, either on Friday night or Saturday night, and say, Danny, I got two tickets to the Phillies game, and I would actually go for Friday night, to be honest with you. I got two tickets to the Phillies game on Friday night. I've got them in hand. Let's go. There you go. If you want to get it, that's not jumping rope. That's a Phillies game. And, you know, they're in the pennant race, and they're playing the Braves, and I'm on the uh, Philadelphia Phillies MLB.com website, and tickets are available. That's what I would do. Okay. And then when you said you were looking at the charts and that this was all meant to be, right? Yeah, but it's not easy, though, because it's in the eighth house, and so you've got to go through, like, a lot of your fears. You know, you've got to go through a lot of that scorpionic territory of so, the eighth house. So, Abandonment, so year, lying, cheating, right, all those right. things, Saturn will bring that up for you. So next year, do you see him actually moving in with me? Well, here's what it's, I think. I think if you can just kind of cool your jets a little bit and allow Jupiter to come into your eighth house and allow this thing to unfold organically, you're going to be fine. But the big okay. – the big. The big ticket item for you is the Pluto Saturn opposition, which takes okay. place in 2014. You've got that's down the line. So just relax. Go buy yourself a couple of Philly tickets. That at the very least you can always sell them. It's not a big deal if he doesn't want to go. But I'm telling you right now, if I'm a guy and he's probably a guy that me, you know, probably has a more than a passing interest in baseball, getting two tickets to the Phillies game, that'd be so cool. Say, hey, I got two tickets to the Phillies game. Let's go. I'm just throwing that out there to you, okay? Right. Yeah, I'll so, tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because Mars, which is the planet of activity, right, and sport will be conjunct the sun during that time. Oh so, yeah, he loves the he loves the Phillies. There you go. Get go get a couple of Philly tickets. I know, but what I'm saying is, when do you see?
see him coming forward and asking me out. Oh, look, look, you, you got to drop that right now because because you essentially blew him out of the water, okay? You blew him out of the water by 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 getting heavy with him and, and having your fear dominate the conversation with him. You know, now now really the move now it's on the, the in, in my estimation the move is on you. And with Mars in Virgo, and again, I'm an astrologer, you can either listen to me or not. Okay? But with Mars conjunct sun in the ninth house, which is the house of sport, next to your midheaven, if you wanted to have a moment where he would go out with you, two tickets to the Phillies game would be that moment. And you can you can do with it whatever you want. And that's that's my advice to you. And hang in there and wait for Jupiter. Nurture the relationship. It's not going anywhere. I mean, when I say it's not going anywhere, it's not. I'm not saying that it's not going to go anywhere. He's going to be around. Trust me. Sun conjunct Saturn. This is the, you're you're going to know this guy for a long time. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, 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 thank you so much for your time. Yeah. You're bye bye. Bye bye. Wow. Interesting show. Hey, you're uh, listening to the Car Talk. My name is Ed. <laughs> what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> Hello. Hi there. How are you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not sure how I am today. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> please please tell me that you're calling me from somewhere other than the Eastern time zone and you want to talk about something other than your boyfriend. Please tell me that. Oh my gosh. I am in the East time zone, but oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't even remember my question now. I really don't. Yeah, wow. If I were Danny, I don't know, man. I would. I, would, I, would. I, I mean, you're so wrong. You're telling her to get that ticket. That man is not coming. She talks too darn much. He look with Saturn. And he's a cancer. He's a cancer. Yeah. Trust me, my brother is a cancer. That is too much for him. On, but I'm telling you though, the sun on Saturn. This is this is not going. I mean, this is a relationship. It's an exact. They have an exact conjunction. Her Saturn. I understand that, yeah. but she is scaring the daylight out of I, this man. I agree with you on that. <laughs> I agree with you on that. I totally agree. She scares me. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is it. This is the Scorpio moon, right? It's bringing out this intensity. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Us. I need him. Oh my God! When is he coming? When is he coming? Oh, just relax, relax. Relax, and, and the, even the caller before her, the the woman from New York, was like, "Whoa, Long Island!" It's like, "Whoa, when am I going to get the job?" It, you know, I was, I was, I look, I love people, and I'm here for anybody. Okay, I mean, I don't want to make light of, of of people that call in. I don't want to mock people that call in because they have lives and their lives are just as important as any life on the planet, okay? So I'm here for that, for that process to unfold. But um, but it's, it's you know, I, I'm I, telling you, she is, she just, she's chasing that man away. What she needs I, to I do agree. is agree. just step back, step back. Like you told her in part of the conversation, stop reaching out to him. If he reach out to you, hi, how you doing? Keep it very light. Instead of you saying, come, let's go to the movie. What am I going to see? No, stop. Yeah. <laughs> stop it. That's Mars and Virgo on the midheaven, right? I mean, that's where, that's where her Mars was. Well, I have, so, I, have a, I have a Virgo and, 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 and a Scorpio, but no, I am nowhere like that at all. Trust me. Yeah. If anything, I'm, I'm so aloof, it's not even funny. Too aloof at times, but no. Well, what is your name, my dear friend? <laughs> my name is Dee. Okay, Dee. And um, where are you calling from? I am calling from Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, have we spoken before? I think we did. Probably would be last month, maybe, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah, you sound familiar. Um, so what do you want to talk about today? I don't even know. I'm telling you, my mind just went, whoo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, the only thing that I can think of, I'm really, I want to move. I am getting the urge to move. Okay. Um, not too sure where. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain letters that are actually coming to me. So I don't know what you, you know, what you're picking up on that. 
Uh, let's see. When is your birthday? November 26th. Six. November. And what year? 64. Okay. And uh, what time were you born? Um, 11.55 p.m. You're on the opposite side of me. I'm 11.55 a.m. And where was that? Um, New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay. Um, any town, particular town? Mm, you can just say the county, Essex County, New Jersey. Okay. Okay, let's do this. All right. Moving, 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 moving. Okay, so um, let's see here. Uh, all right, so I'm just trying to figure out where the big anchors are for your chart. Mm. If you wanted to undertake a move, then obviously the best month for you would be right around your birthday and just shortly thereafter going into December. Not always the easiest time to move. But no, you, it's not going to happen because I have a house. I would have to, you know, put it up for sale or rent or something. Mm. So there's a lot of stuff that I have to get in order. Yeah, um, because you want to take advantage of, you know, the sun moving through your fourth house. Okay. Um, which is um, – so here's – Okay. Which you, here's if you wanted to time your move, then um, I would look at the opposition uh, with uh, Jupiter, Jupiter and Mercury in your chart because you have Mercury in the fourth house in Sagittarius, and that's at 28, 20, 26 degrees. So you'd probably want to time it so that it would be connected to the Jupiter opposition at 26 degrees, and at that time, right after Jupiter. Uh, because Jupiter will be at the end of Gemini 26. Now you've got here's what here's what hap, needs to happen for you. Even before that, at 23 degrees, Jupiter is going to move. Jupiter's in your 10th house right now, by the way, which is great for your career. And you're going to have okay. Jupiter, you're going to have Jupiter cross your your North Node in 2013. So you need to wait until after Jupiter crosses your North Node, because you're going to have something. Um, pretty prominent happening for you, for you in your, in your, uh, in your career. So uh, that would be a uh, potential promotion, achievement, recognition, uh, being able to leapfrog up, not just one, but maybe two levels and whatever it is that you're doing. And you kind of need that to take place first. And then what happens is, is then Jupiter goes to um, 25, 26, gets to 28, and it's on the other side of your north node. Whatever's happened with your north node has happened at that time. And the the the, uh, the Jupiter north node conjunction is really powerful. I went through the Jupiter north node conjunction um, a few years back, and um, you know I wound up getting a promotion. A lot of people got laid off. I didn't. Um, so it's a it's actually a pretty powerful time to you know manifest one's direction and 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 um, and potential in their career. So once you're over that, once you're through that, then uh, Jupiter's headed towards Cancer. And Cancer has, you know, what is Cancer? Cancer's the home. And so what you want to do is you want to catch the last few degrees of the Jupiter-Mercury opposition. And what Jupiter will do at that time is it literally like a fuse ignites your Mercury in the fourth house. And that's and that would be uh, potentially one of the better times for you to move or at least put your house up for sale or do whatever it is you need to do. And that is in the summer of next year, okay? So if you wanted to get all your ducks in a row and you wanted a window, that would be potentially the best window for you. And um, it may take you from June to November to sell your place. But by that time, the sun will then be in your fourth house, and then you could relocate and find the house that you really like. So in terms of timing the, uh, with the fourth house, that would be – that would be a time that I would certainly um, uh, look at. You've got Saturn on your Neptune coming, and that's that's see Neptune. You've got Neptune Scorpio at 18 degrees. That happens next year, and that's, that's that opposes your Jupiter uh, in the ninth house. 
Do you have do you have relatives that live around you? Um, I have sons, but they're not you know, probably about an hour and a half away from me. But the places that I have in mind, no, I, there's no one there, no. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so, For yeah, some I, reason, I'm getting drawn to places that start with the letter C. Letter C. C is in cat, yes. Uh-huh. Well, let's look at some astrocartography for, for you. And uh, do you, I mean, is it just the letter C, or do you have, like, a city? No, it's just the letter C. Just the C. That's it. All right. So let's go. Let's just go into astrocartography and see where, for you, would be a really good place. Um. Well, let's see. You've got uh, Uranus on your ascendant in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and the Sun, your natal Sun, runs right off the coast of Charleston. Um, That is the letter C. I would stay away from Chicago because Saturn is on your descendant uh, off to the west coast. I'm sorry, off to the west of Chicago. Uh, What else here? Colorado. um, Colorado's not bad. Colorado's not bad. Uh, You've got Venus going through the western part of Colorado. So um, that might be an area that would be interesting for you. Uh, so that would be – wouldn't be something traditional like Denver, uh, maybe Colorado Springs. You might want to think about Colorado Springs. That's also in Colorado, south of Denver. Obviously, okay. but closer to um, actually maybe even Durango, which is on the western part. That's where your Venus on the IC, M.M. Chelly, which is the home, by the way. You may want to look at Colorado. Colorado could be a very interesting place for you with that Venus line running through it. And but Charleston. not Denver. Uh, well, Denver is – it's okay. I mean, here, let's look at Denver. Just pull it up. Uh, Saturn and the moons, no. It's, there you go. This is an ideal place for retreat and introspection. That's what it says. If you decide to end a relationship, then this combination will assist your efforts. Um, so the attitude to life is down to earth and serious. At times, you might feel older than you actually are. On the other hand, you would be able to develop the maturity, calmness to accept things that you cannot change. So that's not a bad place, actually, if you wanted to go there. Um, okay. And you've got Jupiter-Saturn crossing, Sun-Pluto uh, crossing there. But if you if you go just a little bit further west um, with Venus on the IC, that's, that's when it gets – really happening. Uh, it says creative people can retreat from the hectic pace of everyday life here and find new creativity within themselves. So co- so maybe Colorado as a whole is a place where you can begin to experience that. I you, you, you may want to check that out. Have you been there? I've been, yeah, I've been to um, a few places. I've, I've passed through Colorado Springs, but of course, you know, I would have to go back there and kind of make sure I get that feel that this is where I want to be. Yeah, sounds like a road trip to me, you know. Sounds like you could, you know, go out there and spend, a, you know, a few days and check it out. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. I know I, I know that in terms of, uh, you know, safety, it's probably, probably one of the safest places to be in the United States in terms of right. any kind of, you know, geophysical or tectonic shifts or anything like that. The Rocky Mountains are almost impenetrable. So, you know, it's a pretty solid place. Um, so, you, yeah. so you're saying it is next year, um, around what time, 2013, that I should kind of start? Well, you'd want to you'd want to allow uh, Jupiter to have its its due in your tenth house, and then cross over your true node, your north node, because that's very important in terms of your own. Um, and when does that take place? Human, yeah, so I'm looking at it here. Uh, so I would let's see. Da, 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 da. So by May, by May okay. of next year, J- uh, Jupiter will be on your true node, and then and then then it moves on, and then you get into the Jupiter opposition in June with Mercury, um, and that's and that I think would uh, stimulate that would stimulate uh, all of your um, sort of networking, you know, putting things together, marketing your house, all that stuff with with uh, with the fourth house with Mercury and Sag in the fourth house. So we're looking at next summer then. Uh huh. Around that time frame. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Great. Okay. See, I wasn't. See, I was good. 
Oh, I man. <laughs> God. You never know. I, I, you know, I never know with, with, with you know, who's going to show up and why. It, today was all about Scorpio. Man, did I get some Scorpionic intensity today. I thought I was intense, but I guess oh. I'm not. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank you so much, and have a blessed day. Thank you, Dee. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Wow. All right. So there we go. We end on a positive, airy, atmospheric, affirmative note for the last one hour and um, 48 minutes of navigating the astrological matrix. Never know. You spin the wheel, and whoever shows up, shows up. And we do our best not to turn anyone away. We do our best to have absolutely no judgment. You know what's really funny is that I, when it comes to this with stuff, I have a very little judgment. You know, when, when I'm in this place doing this kind of work, I have very little judgment. In my own life, looking around at the world, I'm, I'm a hell of a lot more judgmental. But in this realm, I'm just not present. But, you know, probably, probably could be if I was pushed. But for some reason, it's just not – doesn't take place here. I was a uh, I was an internet psychic for about a year and a half, and um, I the reason I stopped being this is back in the old days, the very old days when there was no there was when there was no internet. I was a phone psychic. Phone. That's how that's how far back it goes. 1995, I was a phone psychic. That's what I did. I sat around. I waited for people to call, which is not uncommon now. But back then, it was it was fairly new. So I'd have people call me from all over the all over the country, and I've told these stories before, so I won't bore you with them. But I, every every phone call was about a woman and a man. And their man, is he cheating? Is he coming back? What is he doing? Well, I find love. Well, and it was just at some point I just got very uh, depressed. <laughs> I had to stop doing it because this was all I was, you know, dealing with. And today, today was a flashback moment for sure. I felt like I was that guy again in 1995, answering all those questions. And I, you know, and that was when I was using a lot of tarot and doing a lot of just pure psychic work. And um, I'll never forget there was this one woman who used to come to see me physically to get readings, and she, I, and I clearly saw on the cards, it's like, it's like your husband is cheating on you. Not only is he cheating on you, he's got a whole separate life. He's got a bank account. He's got, you name it, this guy has got it laced up, and you don't know a thing about it. And sure enough, that's what happened. And I was telling her, I said, you've got to figure out how you, you, need, you need a backdoor plan because this is, this is going to fall down around you. And she kept coming back again and again and again with the intention or the hope that I would get, that she would get better cards. And she never did. She never did. It was always, huh? You know, it was like just just pull some different cards for different outcome, that kind of thing. It didn't work. It doesn't work that way. And finally, you know, I didn't see her for a while. Finally, she came back and was like, um, everything I theoretically said was right and come true. You know, she was in her cups about it. And I said, well, I told you. But quite often, people don't want to hear the truth. And if they want, they want a predictable outcome. Can't always, uh, can't always have that. It's just the way it is. You have to let go and surrender. There's a higher purpose at work, and it's not always easy to do, especially when people are dealing with or tragic incidents in their life. It's easy to talk about it, but it's not always easy to experience. So I don't want to make light of the process or make it sound cliche or trite because people do go through very challenging things. But there are times when 
you know, you can't do anything. I mean, it's just the way it is. And the best that we can do is to respond gracefully and um, humbly to life circumstances. And perhaps that's really what Scorpio is all about at the end of the day, is surrendering to a, a more profound and deeper level of grace and redemption. You know, I think about Revelation and I think about where we are during these times. And I think about John Peter, who is the uh, the time traveler from the future who came back and told his tale of what happens to the earth from the year 2036. And his description of how in his world, in his timeline, God is much more important than it was during this time. And for all of our so-called spirituality and the explosion of spirituality on this planet, we live in fairly godless times. People are rarely ever to call God, God, right? Which might be an acronym for something completely different than God, higher power, universe. People are ever rarely to say Jesus Christ, you know, or Savior, or any of those things. Are verboten, but we can talk about Krishna, we can talk about Buddha, we can talk about any number of other deities, even Muhammad. But the, the mere mention of somebody like Jesus brings up all kinds of baggage, and well, it should because there's a lot of baggage around it. I guess what I'm getting at here is that we're living in times where I think people's faith is going to be severely tested and challenged. And to completely rule out this prospect that um, that you know we have denied God in our lives is uh, is hypocritical and dangerous. You know, I think we need to be able to, at the very least, embrace the prospect of a much more profound force that operates in all and through all and that that force is really the most paramount thing that we can get in touch with right here right now speaking of force let's bring in uh, one more caller he's the uh the force from austin the force known as dave hey dave greetings what's going on man oh man oh tough show today Ooh, i know wow <laughs> I'm not sure uh, what I invoked today, but man, it was interesting. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> well, you know, it just made me made me think. It made me it think made that. Uh, think, didn't it? <laughs> That's what it made you think. Well, no, what it really made me think, Phoenix, was, you know, you said something early on in the show about if you could give the good news to the folks, you would like to give it to them. Right. And I uh, really had a thought when you said that, and it's a thought that's been with me for a number of years. Uh, and, and the thought is that it's just an idea or a concept, but we've been leave, living in the shithole at the bottom of the bucket all along and really not realizing it. Yeah, sure. And what goes along with that is the thought process that everything that happens – is going to be worse than the way it is. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting that maybe, just maybe, this is as bad as it gets. Well, let's hope. Let's hope that this is as bad as it gets. I think what I think one of the things that that people need to realize, and, and, and it's and it and it came to me very, it's come to me very clearly over the years, that we 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 live in hell. I mean, this place is hell, and that doesn't mean that we can't have a profound experience because, you know, I looked at William Blake and, and the Proverbs of Hell and, and the marriage of heaven and hell. And one of the great uh, passages of Blake is when he's uh, dealing with uh, Satan uh, on the rivers of uh, on the, you know, the rivers of sticks and hell and having a very fine time doing it. He's able to basically recast that place as not being hell. And he sees hell as being the industrialization of the earth, which was taking place during his time. And so what he does is he kind of recasts 
everything. And I think we have the potential to do that, but I think we have to realize kind of where we are. And um, that's just my my two cents. And that doesn't mean that it's that that it's all going to go to hell because you know I think that there's some really powerful uh, movements and powerful awakenings taking place in people's lives. But as people wake up, you know, they begin to realize just how you know how bad and how corrupt and how awful things are and have been for for many years. And that's and that's part of it. You cannot go through that process without really becoming fully aware of that. That at least that's what I think. Well, it's a fine line, isn't it? And uh, you know, when when the callers were on there, I, I just got to thinking it's this is all happening as we speak. I mean, look at the realities we live in that are so different. Yeah. Uh, you know, one lady's worried about a boyfriend, and you know, other person's worried about going to the bathroom. Another person's worried about the, uh, the the price of gas, and another one's worried about you know the world going to hell in a handbasket. Right. I, you know, I think when we wake up, I don't really think this place has to get darker, doom and gloomy. I think when our reality changes, it changes. Yeah. If, and that's where I'm at, Miss Phoenix. It, mm-hmm. Are we being controlled and manipulated by this cabal, or aren't we? Well, here, here's what's happening. I, I we're going to be. Uh, uh, we've got 30 seconds left in the show, okay? And I kind of want to end it on the hard stop. And I would say the answer is yes and no. I would say ultimately no, and I would say in the interim yes, and that's that's my answer. And I and, and I and I think what's at least for me, there's an evolutionary process of waking up, and you get through this this scorpionic realization of what's taking place around you, and then something else clicks in, and then you and then the individual can then become much more accountable for for their reality, their thoughts, their emotions, their feelings. And it's like, well, what do you want to create based on that? And I think that's where it gets liberating. And, and you know, that's my, that's my two cents. Well, man, I know you got to go. And uh, anyway, I'm here. Uh, uh, give me a heads up when you're uh, ready to make the move and all that. Soon. It's coming. Today it's coming. was absolutely beautiful here today. It must have been like 70 until noon, 75. Yeah. Uh Breezy, bluebird day, no uh, uh, fake clouds in the sky here today. Sounds great to me. So it's been it's been pretty awesome. Well, good. Listen, man, I'm going to send you an email, okay? And I'll tell you okay. kind of where I'm looking at uh, at uh, landing, and then you and I can have a dialogue offline, all right? Okay. okay, excellent. All right, Dave, thanks for calling, as always. Appreciate it. Have a great day, man. See you, man. If you're listening, you're listening to the stream. Actually, not listening to the stream, listening to the podcast, which is available here on Blog Talk Radio or YouTube. So, um, with that, thank you for listening and calling in and being a part of the show. No matter how the show was or went today, it was one for the record books. And uh, with that, um, use your head to discern what's real, your heart to stay open to what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. I'll be back with the Friday Firecast guest to be determined. This is interesting. What is this? I don't know what this is, but I'm going to play it. I'll see you on Friday. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Thank <laughs> you.